Hey, Shaka. Hi. It's good to see you. Likewise, likewise. Um, so wait, what were you saying about we're not color coded? You were like, I'm the yeah. We, we didn't yeah. talk about outfits. We didn't talk about like, man, you know, no. if you're going to do something like this, you got to go all out. So the next time that we do this, we we need outfits. We need coordinating looks. All yeah, of, that all look. That lip is very. I, I'm trying. <laughs> court side. It's a court side lip. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, I think one thing you know we were talking about is just thinking about this whole year and the fact that you and I had been in touch before Date and Society, and then oddly put together a year later or so in it, but we never got to be together. And right. you know, I. Um, had been lurking around DNS for a year or two before the fellowship. And so I had gotten to meet Rigo in person and I'd gotten to hang out with people at the, you know, at these, at these lunches and have someone important spill wine on my shoe and apologize a lot. You know, I had those experiences, but I'm curious for you. Um, I mean, during COVID, it's been such a wild, such, such a crazy complicated time like what has it been like for you as a dns fellow during this period it's funny that um data and society was both the space that i felt furthest removed from um in terms of physicality because you know we were supposed to be in new york and we were supposed <laughs> to be in this office and all of these things that we were supposed to have happen um, and then for COVID to have completely changed the way that we do work and the way that um, community, we think about community and the way it's assembled, especially in uh, an environment like this one. Um, it's weird that that happened, but this is also the place where I felt most connected to people because I was able to be honest and very truthful about how uh, I was weathering the pandemic, how my family was weathering the pandemic, and to show up in ways um, at Data and Society, even when I didn't show up, right? Even when I was not there, uh, even when you saw my picture instead of seeing me on video, um, to show up in ways that I couldn't anywhere else. And so the, the experience overall, I would say, was really affirming in that sense. Um, and it's not that, you know, I walk through the, the door, so to speak, and that's immediately the vibe that I got, but in the conversations, in the intentionality of the language that people used, um, in the way that people presented themselves, it became very clear that folks were really authentic about who they were and what they were doing here and what they wanted to be doing here. And that helped me to be more authentic about myself and how I was showing up and saying, I'm not okay and things are not okay. And I, I need y'all to understand that. I mean, having been, having had some sort of relationship with DNS for a few years now, you know, and, I, and DNS is constantly engaging in these processes of self-reflection and in really engaging issues of, of difference. And I hate to even use the word diversity, but diversity in ways that I think other institutions could benefit from. Mm -hmm. um, if, of course, they're always still doing that work, but you know, so there are always going to be issues. And yeah, I felt that there was part of my own ability to land in DNS from the very beginning had to do with there was a certain kind of critical mass of people of color right. at DNS as an institution. And, you know, I, I can't speak for staff or for full time employees or other other um, other folks. But for for me, that was why I applied. And like you, I was able to really find a sense um, of, of belonging. Like I felt, I was able to still feel connected to people and to my, my research areas. And I think especially um, the Data and Society AI Now um, reading group and also the raw material seminar where research and writing, those were really helpful and, and generative and generous. 
And so I, I hear you when you talk about that. I, I knew that I could always just say to someone, I am not feeling it. I am having an issue. Please help me or leave me or leave me alone and or leave me alone. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that could really be honored. And I think that I think that's something that, that does say something about DNS as an institution that is willing to interrogate itself and to take seriously the work that the people who come through DNS do, right? Who can show you, for example, the, um, the ways like, you know, who can sort of challenge the idea that telecommuting would somehow be, um, would subtract something from the organization or institution, as opposed to putting people's material well-being first and saying, it's not good for us to be in the office. We're not gonna be in the office. Mm -hmm. You know, if you need more time, take it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. but I mean, all of that said, I feel that I personally, I feel that I created very little work, like original work. You know, certainly my, I did maybe half or a quarter of what I had hoped to do during my um, fellowship period. You can, you can excise that from the transcript if necessary. Um, <laughs> I did 175 We're not, we're not using those did. metrics. We're not using those metrics. <laughs> So, but yeah, but there was the sense too of, um, I was able to get feedback, but definitely during COVID, and I know this was true for you, is that I just felt like I was <clears throat> moving through molasses sometimes. It was like mean molasses too, because it wasn't just slowing me down, it was really was slowing me down. Molasses. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, so, you know, to your point about how much you got done, one of the things that, I really want to credit um, the data and society staff on in particular is developing this language for understanding and valuing the work that we each do that contributes to the organization that contributes to our respective disciplines and that contributes to the world like the fact that we were able to step into this organization and be a part of it and be able to say, you know, here's when it's not working for me, here's when I need some help. That is all a result of years of labor and difficult conversations that staff members in particular, um, as well as some of the fellows, some faculty fellows have had over the years, right? That's, that is a matter of the foundation that they have laid. What we contribute to that in this moment, and I think that's one of the reasons that this moment is so pivotal, like in the middle of the pandemic, because the pandemic ain't over, um, is reassessing how we think about what work is and how it's measured. Mm -hmm. It's work to sit behind the computer, to make the commitment to show up at a certain time on a certain day to sit behind the computer and to be engaged in intellectual exercises with other people, to have done the prep work to do that in advance. So it doesn't have to be, I came out with 10 blog posts, I published a peer reviewed article, or I got something published in this big publication that people across the world read, or even in this subversive venue that only a few people know about, but it's awesome and critically acclaimed here. Those are not the metrics that we're shooting for. Mm -hmm. The metrics are a matter of authenticity. Like, did you do what you could do? And did you do it in community? Did you do it in a way that was true and respectful to yourself and the practices of wellness that you've accumulated over the years that you've come to practice? Like, did you do it in a way that honors the work that people who have been in this role and been in complementary roles in data and society um, have created for you to be able to work in that way? Like, that's the assessment that we're looking mm -hmm. for, you know? And being able to do that, which you did, like when we came to the reading groups, you know, I, I felt like I had it easy because I, I could sit back and wait for Shaka to drop some hot comments. And then that, that was it. You know, maybe my space was to put some comments in a, the little chat box or whatever. <laughs> but those are the ways that I am really encouraged and was encouraged by you and folks within the organization to think about work differently. I think um, a lot of that comes from, for me, 
Sarita's leadership and her scholarship about work and labor and, and thinking about uh, things in that way. Um, to that end though, I, I'm curious about what you wanna do post data in society. Like we've had this transformative year, transformative for all manner of reasons. <laughs> what do you wanna do next? I mean, I was gonna ask you a question about like, how would you have defined your work before oh, dear God. COVID and how would you define it now? But to answer, to actually answer your question, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think this refusal of productivity is going to be lasting. Um, it, it's fortunate that I like my, um, you know, my academic year ended and I'm beginning a sabbatical now. So I have this extended period of time to really reflect. But I'll tell you what I've been doing. I've been looking up um, things like singing lessons. Mm -hmm. I've been looking up um, who can, who has licensed massage therapy programs in the immediate vicinity. Um, I've been thinking um, a lot more like in my normal writing practice, for example, when I'm in a writing mode, it's minimum three hours a day mm. and I break it up, right? It's broken up into like two and a half hours and a break and a little bit more, whatever. It's not like all concentrated. Um, and then in like when I'm in serious writing mode, it's five hours a day, you know? So it's nine to 12, take a couple hours off and then you do again from like two to like, Two to, two to four, two to five, depending on how you stretch it. These days, because you know, one thing I encountered, one challenge I really encountered during the pandemic was just my body was just refusing. Mm -hmm. Like it was just telling me over and over and over again, like you cannot sit. Like, and I exercise, I do yoga, I take walks, I set timers, I get up, I stand up, I walk around, it didn't matter. It was that on some level, I'm at a point now where I know that if I'm sitting for more than two or three hours a day, yeah. I'm hurting my, my body. Yeah. So I'm, I'm at a place now where I'm working on a transcription um, of a conversation between me and three other black queer anthropologists. And I'm like, maybe I should just pay someone to do it, the transcript, to just double check it against the recording. Um, maybe instead of sitting here, maybe that's not what I should be doing. So I'm really, I'm really thinking about that big picture stuff, that wholeness stuff. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what else I'm thinking about too. Black academic survivalist to boot camp. Come on, come on. <laughs> like, get your institution to pay me some money to help you survive it. And, and a lot of it would just be like to borrow from what my friend um, Lyndon Gill at UT Austin was saying. Is like during the pandemic, he he's been he was stuck in, um, I think in Trinidad and, you know, he's getting all these requests for things, but he didn't have a strong Wi-Fi. And he was like, I decline. <laughs> it was just total Bartleby the, Scrib the, the Scrivener. It was like totally, um, I prefer not to. Mm. I decline, I prefer not to, I prefer not to, I decline. So the stuff I've been doing lately, like this conversation, super happy to have it. This Black Queer Anthro Roundtable, super happy to have it. I did um, something about post-digital intimacies where I've been creating now, um, which I started working on um, at Data and Society, these kind of like partially pre-made, um, already documentary things, almost like a, a hepped up version of a PowerPoint, of like a, of a rich, you know, media rich PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. And then I've been creating, um, when I give it as a talk, I'm combining this pre kind of done thing, this little film that I've made with this live performance. And I'm trying to like, just create resonances. So my, right now I'm very like, I'm not think tanking, I'm feel tanking. And I want to have more kind of embodied experiences. I want to have more, um, more joy vis-a-vis uh, -vis more refusal. Yeah. And um, like with some of the other, you know, this kind of the stuff that comes with every institution that we're at, I'm just like, I decline. <laughs> I decline. I decline. That's it. Subtract it. Been... <laughs> no. I, I, I took it and I subtracted it from the ledger. And now, no, it doesn't. It's not there. Yeah. Dude, it's so freeing. I love it. It's freeing. Yeah. It. So. 
And the massage therapy thing is like, I just need my body touched and I want to touch <laughs> human bodies and, and, you know, um, cor correctly, appropriately cannot do that in the classroom, just the mind, just the <laughs> mind body. Um, but I, I think that it's, it, it's um, to find refuge and companionship and friendship in institutions without getting attached mm. to things in that institution will do anything for me ever. Mm. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's real. I had a similar lesson. Um, and I, I would put a lot of that in, in terms of pre-COVID and, and post-COVID. Um, I don't know, it all kind of flows together and works together as my overall experience. like being in academia you know i didn't know that academia was a career choice i i did it my mother was the first person in our family to go to college she turned out to be an md great wasn't gonna be me <laughs> not the kid who passed out in biology like dissecting frogs wasn't gonna happen but you know i'm here because i followed this impulse to study something that i saw happening online that I knew was significant from my own lived experience and that I also knew media was getting wrong according to its narratives. And that wasn't even what I really wanted to study, but I, it's not what I intended to study, I should put it that way. But I did um, and it helped me out being my backup topic for a dissertation and 10 years on, it continues to be productive and I think that's ultimately because at the root of it, I am doing work that I'm committed to, that I have a full fledged commitment to like heart, body and soul, because it's not about an institution. It's not about a specific technology. It is not about, you know, being able to go give talks or even uh, the luxury that a tenure track position affords. And it is a luxury to be able to make your own schedule to a certain degree and to be able to work from just about anywhere. Um, but it is the commitment to black people and to black liberation, which it's like, how, how are you talking about black liberation and black Twitter? Believe me, it's all in there. Um, that, that creates that space. But even with that and doing it inside of an institution like the university, there is, an ability to very quickly descend into overwork, into this internalized set of expectations that these institutions have for us. And for me, that is the delineator in my work pre-COVID and post-COVID. Because pre-COVID, it was a matter of, I'm a very check the boxes girl. Like I'm not, I, I gotta say, I'm not the most original one out there. I'm just not. But if I know what the formula is, I'm gonna rock the hell out the formula. And then I'm gonna go on and do whatever the next thing is. COVID totally threw that into disrepair. Because you can know the formula. You can have the timeline but things will happen in your world that are so far outside of your control. And this pandemic certainly wasn't the first one of those things. Um, you know, I tell a story about my dissertation and how it became my dissertation because of something that was totally outside of my control. The job that I took finishing my PhD, I took because my father passed away totally outside of my control. This job that I got here at UVA, I took because I wanted to be close to my then um, partner, now spouse. You know, these things were so far out of my control, but COVID was the one that let me know that not only was this stuff outside of my control, but my internalized attempts to try to bring it more underneath um, my control, we're going to make me very sick and ultimately kill me. Yeah. And that is what I learned in this year going on now, 18 months almost, right? That um, you've got to find another way. You have to be 
so flexible and find other ways to think about the work that you want to do and how it gets done and to what end to think about how you want to care for yourself and where you're going to commit that sort of care to yourself. I have taken more time for myself in this past year to 18 months than I ever have in my life. And it's been a matter of going to doctor's appointments, getting those massages because my body physically hurts from sitting in chairs for so many years, doing meetings and writing and reading and those sorts of things. I had an accident, a car accident, completely outside of my control, wasn't my fault, totally screwed up everything. Again, another opportunity to learn that you can work this way that is ultimately defined for you externally, or you can choose to work the way that works best for you. And that is what has been set aside and set apart for me in this experience. And I'm just really appreciative that in that time, I had the space like data and society to recognize that these things were indeed a choice, that they are all choices. You know, it's funny, you know, I think we're like 30 minutes into our conversation and, you know, this will be repurposed and fleshed out in some, in some way and our bios will be there. So everyone will know what it is that we do. But we haven't actually talked about any of our um work yet either Absolutely. and so i was wondering i'm going to try to introduce myself and like the work that i do um and then you should do that and then we should there's some things that we have you know in sort of in common that we both look at or think about in our work or in our teaching um that i'd love for i'd love to like you know riff with you on um so i was trained first as a visual artist and then kind of through a series of you know, like a new, like circumstance, things happened and I became an anthropologist. I got a PhD in anthropology. I, so I'm an ethnographer of, um, of media, art and technology through the lens of race and queerness. And so my work has covered everything from public sex to analyses of zombie media to discussions of, um, you know, the ways that you know, my personal histories intersect with my research interests, which is kind of the stuff I work on now, or at least in, like literally in this moment. Um, but along the way, you know, you know, we, you and I have a lot of overlap, including things like, you know, um, you know, black media, black Twitter, think talking about cancel culture, um, and thinking more broadly about the ways that blackness is framed um, or within contemporary uh, media discourse. Um, you want to give your little, yeah. Who, yeah are you? Sure. Who are you and what do you do? <laughs> um, yeah, so I am an assistant professor uh, at UVA, which sits on the unceded territory of the Monacan and the Manahoac peoples, um, and was built through the labor of enslaved Africans. Don't leave that part out. Um, that's my current gig. I am a person who is trained as a journalist and I am committed to Black liberation, um, specifically through a focus on the way media is used and the way media talks about Black people. Um, that focus for me comes from growing up in Lexington, Kentucky and seeing how Black people were missing from the news, except for where we were criminalized or we were seen as um, individuals, even creatures for entertainment. And so over the years, I have always been really interested in the way news media in particular talks about Black people, who we are, what we do, and how we do it. And thus, I have studied what I call very broadly race, media, and power, and how the three intersect which leads to everything from studying the diversity, equity, and inclusion industry within journalism um, to Black Twitter and Black online communities and digital spaces. Um, your work in particular, not my work, your work, not my work, your work. I mean, people will be quoting you on Twitter, like on TikTok, Twitter, leave it aside. But I sent you a TikTok video where someone was work, like using stuff from your cancel culture. You're now a uh, famous cancel culture, <laughs> you know, but I want to talk. So I want to talk about that, but I want to talk to you just about something that I, in our conversations over the last year and now too, that I think is important is that 
from my experience, and I think you might share this, is that I do the work that I do because I'm learning something from those social worlds. Like I am learning something about how to navigate life as a Black queer person through my curiosity and through my intuition and through learning from what um, these, these digital publics, um, among others, um, per, you know, contain and, and produce. And I, it sounded that about your kind of getting into it, that, that there's something about that there for you as well, that there's, there are life circumstances. There's, Ooh, is that a landline? Ever get a phone call. <laughs> keep that in, keep that in. Please hold. <laughs> Hello. All right, thanks. Bye-bye. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wanted to leave it on because I didn't know who it was. It could have been something interesting. It was a letter of recommendation for a student of mine, Disability Rights Action Group. So she's going to get that job. Um, but so we were talking about, um, Oh yeah, like the the kinds of the various ways we learn from the social worlds in which we uh, that we study and how we got into the work that we did. Yeah, I mean, we learn from it every day. Like I, so it it was really interesting um, earning a PhD in the time frame that I did. I did not. Uh, I didn't have a critical background in in any of this. Right. I. I got a political science degree in undergrad from Florida a &M University. Right, right, let's see, right back there. There it is, okay. Um, I have a master's in journalism and a PhD in mass communication. At no point in any of those programs was there a specific focus on critical theory, on black feminist theory, on queer theory, on any of these. And so, you know, the hip kids today can say, oh yeah, you haven't done the reading. Well, honey, the, the reading wasn't, no one was doing the reading anywhere in any of these programs. Like I wasn't over with the anthropology kids. I didn't know the anthropology department existed at the time I went and did my PhD until I took two courses there and changed everything. Um, so I learned a lot from being in these digital spaces. Like 2009, 2008, when I first joined Twitter to 2012, I would say, the education that I got from being in those spaces, from the authors and the creators and the activists and the people who were just struggling who were mentioned in those spaces, whose names and work and ideas, I would have never heard in the formal education settings that I was in were, were and are invaluable to me. But not only those, but the way that people reflect on what it is to live and what it is to have a black life in those spaces is to take the things that I have remarked on, um, you know, in, inside with a certain sense of interiority and thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm the only person who thinks about this sort of thing like that and realize that, no, no, you're not. There are plenty of people who are thinking about this and talking about it and building around it and living it every single day. And that is so affirming. It's one of the reasons I haven't left Twitter yet. As, as terrible as a place, as Twitter can be. It's one of the reasons I haven't left Twitter yet. Because um, I'd never want to be disconnected from that, you know? And that's, I think, part of the lifeblood of being in digital spaces and in online communities. There's so much affirmation and reaffirmation that happens in those spaces. I'm curious about what some of those spaces are for you. What are the particulars? <clears throat> I mean, when I first started grad school, you know, I'd gone to a very small private school in the middle of Iowa. And this is like, you know, like our my senior year, we had email, you know, but 
that was like we graduated. I graduated in 1997, so there was no internet. Just in the cornfields doing all of our, you know, Kierkegaard. Um, and when I ended up in Austin, Texas, in grad school after you know a couple of years doing other things in um, 1999. I really found myself in these gay, these queer online spaces, mostly gay, but sometimes queer, like sort of more broadly understood. And then it was about these chat rooms in like uh, gay.com and you could have hundreds of people in these in these rooms. And and for me, you know, that I'd been out for four or five years at that point, but I didn't have references beyond beyond books. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, I was that person who I read all of the, you know, I, I read the, the classic literature, I looked at all the contemporary art books, but, you know, being in the top floor of my library at, at Grinnell College in, you know, 1996, reading contemporary art books is not the same as being in a city that has like a lively life. And so I think I was always, I learned a lot about being queer online um I learned some about I learned about online racisms very like early in those spaces as well um and and then I think I always just sort of had kept an eye I was just always interested in what how the internet and how the web what kind of affordances it produced for queer people and how queer people were making the web queer or like how and shaping it and I would say it's the same in terms of thinking about it in terms of blackness as well right like you know marginalized groups created publics that were the publics that were needed the intimate publics that were needed in order to continue to to survive to create culture and i think you know your discussions and this is why i wanted to talk with you a little bit about the cancel culture stuff too is just that um you know like so many different aspects of American culture or so many different American cultural forms, you know, cancel culture as a kind of concept and as I would say really as a practice as well, comes from Black um, online publics. And now, like critical race theory, it has become, you know, weaponized um, against the very people who use those things to insist upon survival. Mm -hmm. You know, it's being used again as another method to erase mm -hmm. and to hear. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the ways that how a term like cancel culture is understood or um, similarly like critical race theory, like how these terms are produced, how they um, how they circulate and how they come to function is really is really interesting. I think both of us are concerned with that. And I was reading just this morning. I don't know why I did this because it just makes one upset. This is why I don't, I'm on Twitter, but I don't really mess with Twitter. Mm, I feel that. You know, like I post, you know, if it's a political event, I post. If it's an academic conference, I post. Um, but I'm not super active on, on Twitter. I don't even lurk that much because I get worked up. Mm -hmm. but I, read, I read some, you know, some nonsense about you know i guess i i read that uh nicole hannah jones got she got um she was like i'm going to howard mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So she was offered after all of the mm -hmm. chicanery um at unc the position the tenured position and she declined and now she's at howard so i was reading that this morning and then i was trying to go back and just to be like okay what were the things again that people were so like that were they're like oh it's that it's wrong or it's bad and it's like because I read a lot of it when it came out and I was like, this is very helpful. It's very useful to understand. And it seemed to me that a lot of it, like 80% of the critique, 85% of the critique is like not the essential parts. It's like using a qualifier sum instead of all or, or assuming the all. It's very, this does not change it. And, and I, I recall just, you know, like in um, an early part of this year of 2021, I kind of got into Clubhouse a little bit. I got roped into it by a friend <laughs> and I enjoyed it for a while. I was really enjoying it, especially with Rosé. But um, <laughs> one day I like clicked into this room. My friend like tapped me and said, we should come join this conversation. And it was about critical race theory. And it was instantly clear that the moderators had no idea uh -uh. what it was, uh -uh. where it came from. They hadn't read and these were all, of course, you know, like 
some people like of color stirring the pot themselves, right? So uh -huh. it was like, they didn't know what it was, where it came from. And they actually kind of approached when I said, if you don't know where it is and you don't know the key concepts and the key authors, and this is just clickbait. And then it was a sort of conversation about, well, why are you being ableist and elitist? I'm like, first of all, that original article by Kimberly Crenshaw is very easy to read. It is not complicated. It is not a complicated article. That first thing about intersectionality is not complicated. And I thought I lost my mind. I, I, I just was like, okay, done. Got off. Close and then 15 up. minutes later, I was like, back no. on the well, I have to. And then I realized it's just a mistake. I mean, I, so I think this is, you know, you're in this territory, right? Where you've written this paper now about cancel culture. I'm sure people come at you for doing this and not doing that. Or um, I'm sure you've been asked a thousand boring questions about it. And I'm, I'm almost certain you want to like move on to something else. But, you know, when I think about, when I think about this work, it is what we need right now, like a lot of the other work that DNS has done around misinformation and disinformation, we need to know the intellectual history. We need to know the, the, gene, the regular genealogy of a concept. And then we need to be adept at being able to define and apply the term in ways that are appropriate. And then I wonder, are there ways of shutting down those conversations that are just so out there and so wrong? Or is it always, is it still just don't feed the trolls? Oof, these are tough questions. And man, it's, it's hard because the intellectual impulse is to do the reading, to do the searching, to engage in the debate and the conversation. And I will never say that that's a bad thing, but from my perspective as a journalist, what I know for sure is that it doesn't matter. When we talk about concepts like so-called cancel culture, we are not talking about the specific etymology of the words. We're not talking about the richness of the history behind it. What we are talking about is how language is effectively weaponized as a means of suppressing a group of people. And I think it is a more effective use of our time to focus on that part of the fight than the intellectual parts of it. We do need to know. We need to educate people who are willing to read, learn, listen, engage in good faith. But we also need to recognize that these are, I mean, these are really tools of almost psychological warfare. I, I hesitate to say that, but it's true. This is something that dates back to taking, to making learning how to read and write illegal for Black people. It is something that dates back to taking language from Indigenous people and subjecting them to re-education. Because if you can strip identity from a group of people, you can tell them anything. You can create any sort of narrative and give it to them. And what's happened is that effectively, this conversation around cancel culture has been used to shepherd one group of people further along one way in terms of there's a them and there's an us. And we are over here and they are trying to cancel us. It doesn't matter what canceling means. It doesn't matter where it came from. It doesn't matter that it is really a very intimate process. Like if I cancel someone, that person likely has no idea who I am or that I exist, especially if we're talking about a politician or a celebrity. Right. And so that's why I, I get a little bit frustrated when I'm asked to talk about cancel culture because I'm like, on one hand, you know, I want to make sure that this is down for the historical record. But on the other, I feel bad for almost contributing to this ongoing problem <clears throat> of this exercise in absurdity in which the point is not so much to use language effectively 
as it is to manipulate language to get people to be able to use people effectively. Because if I can manipulate you through this language to get you to believe X, Y, and Z about other people in this country or other people throughout the world, it doesn't matter what the terms mean. And it doesn't matter what history they have. And it does seem like the process, I mean, two things. So one, the current deployment of cancel culture to me is just gas, it just reads as gaslighting. Same with critical race theory, right? It's all the people who actually do this kind of work and who think about these issues intellectually, politically, um, in terms of activisms, you know, none of that, it's just, it's just been redeployed kind of now, you don't, you, you can't hold on, you can't contain that meaning anymore. And I sort of hear that, right? Like, it doesn't matter if you say, this is where it comes from and this is what it means. If the way people are using it is eight out of 10 times, something totally, totally different. And, and we've seen the same, Thing. We've seen it with political correctness. We've seen it with, or the other um, political correctness is sort of the key one that comes to mind, but um, multiculturalism, all of diversity, like these were all the kind of same things. And it's always, you know, it seems to me that it's the people who are the most powerful who protest the most about being canceled and yet who somehow still manage to like hold on to their, to their, to their positions, you know, and I, and I think that there's a, um, there is like a richness now like in the comedy of it so um like it's only like you say it doesn't matter and there's something and you say use the word absurd and i think um yeah i absolutely so whether it is you know the hypocrisy the so-called hypocrisy of the left who cancel people for perceived slights you know um like real or perceived um uh, mistakes or it's the right who uses the term in this completely either in a mixture of like the willfully ignorant and the, you know, and the committedly stupid, um, you know, sort of way is that it, it can't, um, like what work can it really still do? It's, it's a, it's a punchline, yeah. right? It's a punchline on SNL. And maybe that's now where that term, maybe that's good that it is a punchline. So because we can know that whatever, meanings are attached to it or um, that it's sort of filled with that they um, that it's just like a, a balloon you could just pop mm -hmm. right to really try to understand like well what's what's really happening I am curious you know in my own like I'm, I spend more time on TikTok than any other social media app mm -hmm. and I find partly I think because of the I think just their algorithm is just so good that I don't, um, I don't really, I have a lot of positive stuff on my TikTok. Very little, there's no negative, there's no negativity, there's none of, you know, there's none of that. But I do wonder, you know, I'm like, just what, um, you know, what does it take, what does it take to be canceled now? Or what does it, um, sorry, I was like moving a little far afield. I'll give you an example for my students. And then I think maybe we can talk about the, the, the comedy, the absurdity of it, but also the, the seriousness of it. So within like the, my own, um, within with my students, and this has been going on for like five, six years now, right? As my students become increasingly politically sophisticated, they, they do also um, seem to sometimes have these very absolutist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. approaches, like this kind of like all or nothing. Yes. And there's sometimes a cognitive dissonance that I always try to point out to them, that I always try to like push against with them, mm -hmm. where it's like, I believe in prison abolition, but all rapists should be chemically castrated. Like those don't go together. There's like, there's a tension there, right? Or, um, yeah. you know, yeah. a lot of the sort of, these sort of like comical examples of cancellation can occur in ways where, um, you know, so the, the, the trans uh, the trans philosopher contrapoints Natalie Wynn has made dozens and dozens of fantastic video essays. And in one video essay, she uses a 30 second voiceover from Buck Angel, a trans man who some identify as um, as problematic for his for, he's a trans man, but his own beliefs on trans and trans uh, transgender transgenderism and trans transsexuality they believe are problematic and so they've you know they so they like um by this sort of transitive property will cancel her as mm. well right so these sort of excesses you know show to me something about that 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 impulse to silence that violent sort of impulse to 
um, to kind of quash that 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 almost sometimes glee in um, that one can find in some of these examples of of um, just the just seems so out of scale. You know, I was going to joke with you and like try to like be like, what would what would you get canceled for? And I was like, oh, I shouldn't maybe put that in. It's, it's coming. And, you know, <laughs> like, it's, it's coming. too many, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, so I don't know. I, I just kind of had like a verbal spew, but I wonder if there's anything in that that kind of like sticks with you or that you would want to point out, especially like the comical stuff, because it just does, some of it is just like, I don't even know how to approach it without humor. I mean, there was a there was a very, you know, in the the origin story of people being canceled, people being called out. There's a very serious issue to consider, and that is those without access to power to hold people accountable for actions who have harmed uh, their communities, who have harmed them individually, like this is a last resort, right? And so there's that to acknowledge, but then we do have to acknowledge the comical and the absurdity of things. When we are talking about how the scale has been so far blown out of proportion with the adoption of this behavior and these sort of speech acts on digital and social media platforms. They were never, canceling someone was never intended for this. And I would argue that the early era of social media callouts were effective primarily when they were limited to smaller communities within Twitter. And it was the fault of journalists who took those controversies and made news stories of them to feed into the 24 hour news cycle. That is when we started tipping over into the absurd, right? Right. And so the things that I think about um, with this are, you know, no one's, no one's redeemable. No one's redeemable. Everyone has something that they could be canceled over. My background, my, my dad was a preacher. And so I know, I know my Bible inside and out. I know it in the parable that a lot of people are familiar with, even if they don't know that they are, is about people throwing stones when they probably shouldn't. So there's a woman, she's allegedly caught in adultery. Why the Bible doesn't mention anything about the person she was caught in adultery with, don't know, but um, you know, everyone's got something that they're in, at fault about. That's the bottom line to this parable. And the minute that we start making justice a group sport, mm -hmm. we, we're, we're losing some things. Human beings don't do nuance very well anyway. Yeah. But especially accountability um, via digital and social media, and in this way, it, it's, it's not going to work so well. Yeah. It's, it's sort of the same thing with class action lawsuits. You know, yes, let's, let's have redress for the harms that are done. Uh, but this $40 check that I'm about to get from a printer isn't really doing all that much to help my damaged credit <laughs> that someone yeah. took off with, you know? Yeah. I don't know. It's a terrible analogy, but I... I think there's a lot to be said, um, less so for the individual case and how absurd those things get and more so for the way news media has treated those cases mm -hmm. as though they are symptomatic and emblematic of a larger problem. That is really where I, I get into the, this is this has gotten out of hand. I think that's a that's a conversation then for another day. This sort of role of like media amplification in some of these things, you know, like I don't, I'm like I'm triggered. I want to cancel the New York Times because I keep seeing like articles about critical race theory, you know, like and they're <laughs> terribly not. written. But I'm not, <laughs> and they are terribly written because they, I think, they take from that that um, the people who do this best are the comics, in my view. Absolutely. 
because they, they because they puncture just the just the absolute absolute absurdity of some of what's at stake. And maybe this is a question for us, you know, and I think in my own intellectual and creative and political practices moving forward, I definitely want more lightness, mm -hmm. more fun. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able, you know, I, I don't know, maybe there are there must be ways that we can do some of this work. I think as public intellectuals, people who show up on podcasts and things like that, maybe that's maybe that we're in that position that in between world between the academy and some other public that we can sort of you know insert something into the conversation that just puts it into perspective mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. that puts it into perspective and that makes it just really clear right like opponents who people who are you know enacting laws against critical race theory one are morons and two they're engaging in a process of erasure so even if you don't, even if you think that there were legitimate problems with the 1619 project, the idea that you could reasonably counter that American capitalism, the history of American capitalism was contingent upon slavery, that the nation was built by enslaved and indentured and otherwise oppressed people. That's not, you can't really argue that. Not up for debate. So, you know, if you're arguing, you, you think that critical race theory teaches your kids teaches our kids to hate one another, that's just sort of idiocy. That's just idiocy. That's, 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 a, that's a move that seeks to return to an imagined status quo that never existed for marginalized people. I mean, it's, it's plainly disingenuous. And I think that that is, and that argument altogether is something um, that, you know, the work that we had the opportunity and the privilege to do in this fellowship year um, resounds with me and I think uh, would be so attractive to so many people. You know, I don't know how this artifact will ultimately be used, but as we, wind this conversation to a close. My, my exhortation, if I will, would be that having these sort of conversations is exactly what this fellowship is like and about. And creating things as a result of these conversations is the sort of space that is made, that is made for you at Data and Society. Um, even if you don't feel like, you know, you are the academic type, the one who is the superstar, who knows all the people at the conference, who's published in all the big journals, because uh, for God's sake, that certainly wasn't me, but um, this is a really productive place and a place where you get great feedback on such ideas like this, the conversation that we're having right now. And I think something's gonna come out of this conversation. So mm -hmm. I can't wait I to so. turn this camera off. Right. <laughs> but it is, it's been delightful to be able to have you to myself, Shaka, and then to eventually share your company with, uh, with everyone else. And wanna give a shout out to Rigo for being here, for being um, just amazing, an amazing individual and everyone over there at dns i don't know that's that's my sign off what you got Shaka? i want all of my i want my speech to be turned into a rap rego and, it. and it would just be idiocy idiocy moron idiocy idiocy moron cancel <laughs> this cancel that Drop um, but no i mean seriously thanks for putting together. i mean i feel also that even now ending you know with kind of like head shaking and smiles is it's such a nice relief, it, 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 not a relief, but I recall some of our conversations over this last year and it just sounded sort of like, I was laying on the floor. <laughs> Hello, yes. I got it. <laughs> so it, feels, it feels good to be, to have a sense of, um, to have a sense of opening. And I think both of us should really, you know, I think it would be great for both of us to celebrate ourselves and our successes during this year. And um, we were supported by this, you know, organization and by all of the great um, staff and others who, who work there, but we also, we survived. Yes, we did. And, and there it is. And there it is. We survived. Okay. <laughs>